Good morning, as we go to the chitas of the day, um, we are holding in the book of Bereshis, but we are holding, today is Thursday, so we are holding the fifth reading already. So we are holding already chapter four in Genesis. So everybody needs to um, get catch up. They need to read the first three chapters to uh, catch up to the chitas of today. So we're holding it ready generations after the creation of the world. Because in the first book of Benatius, we have the whole first 1500 years from the beginning of creation to the end of the first book of Benatius. It's the whole first 1500 years because Noyach already happened in the year 1500 around. So it's a 1500 years that the Torah flies through in one portion, the portion of Horatius. So today is Thursday, and we are holding on chapter 4, verse number 19. And Lemach took for himself two wives, Sheim Achas Oda. One wife was named Oda, the Sheim Achas Tzila, and another wife was called Tzila. So now she says it's not necessary to elaborate on this, or who cares? Why is it important to tell us who Lemach married? But to really, the Abraham over here, the Torah wants to tell us what happened at the end of the story. To teach us from the end of the section that the Holy One, blessed be, kept his promise when he said, Vengeance will be brought upon Cain sevenfold, but it won't, he won't punish him till seven generations later. And Lemach arose after he had begotten sons and raised seven generations. Cain had seven generations. And if he had seven generations, then he slew Cain. That is what is meant, Lemach's statement, I have slain a man by my wounding. So Lemach ultimately killed Cain, who was a great grandson of, of Cain. Cain killed Abel. And God said, I will let you live for seven generations. And Cain saw seven generations. Now, Lemach didn't kill Cain intentionally. He killed him unintentionally. He had two wives. Rash says, why do you have two wives? So was the custom, as she writes, in the, in the, in the custom of the generation of flood, one wife was to have children, and one was for the, the beauty. They wanted a beautiful wife. And that was the reason that they had two wives. And so they, that she would be sterile. Some additional father does not appear, and he would adorn her like a bride and feed her with delicacies. But her companion was neglected and was mourned like a widow. This is what Job said. He feeds the barren woman who will not be it, but does not adorn the widow. So it's a sad situation. Mistreated the second wife, the wife who gave them children. Other things have not changed, but it's into beauty. Other, what is other? She was one who, who had the children. Called so because she was despicable to him and removed from him because she, through her pregnancies, she became ugly. Tzila, her name, which he called her Tzila, she was one who from marriage relationships, so named because she was always sitting in the shadows. These are in the Agada in, in, in Bereshis Rabba. Just in general, if you really want to know the story behind the story, especially in Bereshis, these stories are the in the Medrash of these portions. But Taylor, Ada, and Ada had a Yuval. Ada had Yuval, who have Yeshiv oil or Mikna. He was the father who would dwell in the tents and cattle. So now so he was the first to pasture animals in cult, uncultivated places and dwell in tents. One month here, another month there, for the sake of his father. So he became the first shepherd who, who brought about the concept 
of domesticating animals. The passion is placed with the clean and he went to pitch his tent elsewhere. According to the Medrash, he would build houses for idol worship. As it said, the image of jealousy that provokes God. And so did his brother grasp the lyre and the fruit. So his brother also created, he was the one who created the first flute to sing the pagan idols. Shame Achib Yuval, and his brother's name was Yuval, who he was the father of all who grasped a lyre, for Agud, and a flute. So he was the first one who created these musical instruments. But again, he created it for the sake of idol worship. Sila Gami Yoldas Tuval, and Sila also had a child. She was Yoldas Tuval, Kaib. She had two vokain, leitish kocheresh, the chayshes of Basel, who sharpened all the tools to cut copper and iron. Achveis tuval kain, and the daughter of tuval kain was Nama. So now she says tuval kain, he refined the craft of 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 of, of kain. Tuval was related to the word tavlin spices. He spiced and refined Cain, Cain's craft to make weapons for murderers. Leitosh, who sharpened all tools to cut copper and iron. Leitosh, he sharpened the tools for working with copper and iron. So the word yiltosh is to sharpen eyes. So he, Chodesh is not, right, this all grandma's going to, Nama, why does it tell us who the sister of Tuval Kain? Nama, the Torah wants to tell who Nama is, he, Eshto Yishon Nayach. Nama was the, the, the wife, Nayach's wife. So now you know why the Torah is telling us all this history, progeny of this family, really to bring out the next story, the story of Nayach, and who his wife was? His wife was Nama. And that completes the Chumash of the day. Tanya of the day, we start a new letter of the Rebbe, of the Alta Rebbe. And we have a letter 24. Oivai Achai, my beloved, my brethren. That's how the Al Tadeba used to write his letters to his chassidim. Always wrote it to them in a very compassionate, loving expression. I'll not today, I beg you, friends. Excuse me. Beloved to their maker and hateful unto their evil inclination. Do do not wrong. I'll not today. Do not wrong. Let no one make himself wicked before God during one hour, the hour of prayer before God. Which God has chosen that every Jew should pray to him one hour a day. So here in that hour, what are, what are people doing? Like all the So that people can congregate and stand before him during that hour. She's It's an auspicious time for him. So he can, he can come and reveal himself. We're talking about the human being. He can come to a military sanctuary. Mikdashmat in the Gemara. Mikdash Mat is called, every synagogue is called a miniature sanctuary. It was the base on Mikdash, the main sanctuary. And then there was a Mikdash Mat, a small sanctuary. To visit the Shechina of his glory that dwells with them, the Jewish people, in the midst of their impurity. The Abish comes and says, I'm going to be with you. And to be accessible to those who seek him and to entreat him 
and your family. But what does he do? What do we do? We sit and talk and show. We sit and talk. At this auspicious time of prayer, he speaks of his needs. Demonstrates Marabat Bishan Khat Bidus Bain. He's sitting and talking to his friend about his part, whatever, about his, about his business, about his politics. Sit and talk, sitting and talking, he should. Speaks to his needs or demonstrates that he has no desire to contemplate and behold manifestations God managed to include. And Nasim Kaval Xil Elliot. Thus he becomes in pure chariot. A subservient vehicle to the supernal fool, which is clipper. on this clipper, he says, The fool does not desire understanding. And the state in desire, and Rabbi Yitzchakur, This person comes to show. And he doesn't desire to contemplate and to behold the glorious splendor of the greatness of the King of Kings. The Holy One, blessed be he. Lemaila, which will become revealed. The Shazu comes as Shu, you see what I mean? So it comes revealed in the upper world. God's presence is coming to the world. In the lower worlds and upper worlds, there's a Jew. He's having a conversation. And he, God reveals himself to those who earnestly desire to gaze upon the glory and greatness of God, which God invests itself in the words of the liturgy, which is known to all. Davani, prayers. And God reveals himself through prayer, every person according to his understanding, and to the level of his soul. As the verse says, a man praises according to the measure of his intellect. Yahalal, I spelled the world, is pronounced Yahalal. The verse would thus mean a man praises, praise, according to the measure of his intellect, meaning in proportion to his comprehension of God's greatness. Yahalal. According to the proportion of his understanding, that's the way he praises God. Now the kingdom of heaven is similar to the kingdom of on earth. It's cosmic for a king to have his might concealed in his innermost chambers with many guards at the door. That's that so that many people wait for days and years hoping to see his might to come to the king's chambers. All the children's Galaka, when the king, when he wishes to be seen by all, and he proclaims throughout his kingdom that his subject should assemble the Lamelafan and stand before him. So they can show them his majesty, he can come out of his glory. So imagine a king of kings. The king comes and says, announces on a certain day, I'm coming to the center of the city. I'm going to show you my kingship. I'm going to be there. You got there? So can you imagine the whole city comes out to see the king? And then there's a guy talking there. Misha Emilafana, whoever will stand before him and not care to see him, he says, You go, we'll come to the king. And he's having a conversation. And he's dealing with his needs. Hammer, how lowly, foolish, and senseless he is. He resembles an animal in the eyes of all. How could he? The king is standing right over here. The king is sitting here. Surely the king of kings, God is in your midst. And you're sitting and talking in Melodale. And moreover, it's his honor to the king. It's embarrassing to dishonor to the king when he demonstrates before him to have pleasure and delight from grazing upon his glory and beauty and it is of no more esteem in his eyes than busying himself with his own needs. 
So he's showing the king, he's assigning the king, that he thinks that his needs are more important than the king. And furthermore, that is treason, treason. You can understand this when you sit in court, when you talk in court, theft of court. You can't sit and talk in court. You can be silent in front of the judge, in front of the king. If you talk in front of the king, you'll be put to death. The gam of the Moreover, a capital offense to the king. That he's disgraceful and dishonors the king in the eyes of the public. So it's treason. This is what it says. The fool raises, raise the insult. This means that he, that, so to say, that he thought he was a fool, he should not raise his insult, making it as apparent to all. But this is not only dishonor to the king, but constitutes a capital offense. That's stupid. This is dangerous, life and death issue. So it's worse than that. Okay, he can make a stupid fool out of himself. But this fool is not going to survive the day. That's why our sage said that when you go to Davin, when you go to pray, he has to feel like he's standing before the king. Now, if he's standing before a king of kings, why did our sage say as if he's standing? He is standing. Why does he say like if he's standing before king? Rebbe says, at least he should make himself appear as he's standing before king. In the sight of all who look with a physical eye on his actions and the words. So at least let other people think that he's standing before king. Now other people look at the person and says, who's the guy standing for? Standing for nobody. He's talking. He's talking. He's disrespecting. Even though a fool has no thought. So although he does not have the intellectual realization that while standing and praying is truly standing for a king, because he doesn't really realize that, at least let him fake it. At least let him show others that he thinks he's standing before a king. It was concerning this matter, the realization that one is standing before a king, the time that he appointed to reveal his glory to those who seek him, that all prayers were instituted in evidence to whoever meditates deeply upon them. Umi and one who does not show this, she is guilty with a capital offense. And on that person said in the Zohar, he brings disgrace into the spurnal order and shows that he's separate from holiness. The last lechal and he has no share in the God of Israel. Manalas, heaven forbid. Alkein shulchosayah, therefore, Al Rebbe says, I declare, shulchosayah here by acting as an agent of the sages, the sages. I'm doing this in the name of the sages. I'm making an acting decree to apply equal to ever. No idle talk is to be spoken from the moment the reader begins to recite the prayer until the last Kaddish. Whether it's the morning prayer, whether it's the afternoon prayer, whether it's the evening prayer, nobody is to talk from the first, when the Shleach Tzigah, when the, when the cantor starts davening, until the end. And somebody disobeys this intentionally, Yeshav al is to sit on the ground, and humble himself, and he should ask from three people, Whoa, to release him from the supernal excommunication which resulted from the disobeying a rabbinic decree. And he should repent and, and heal himself. 
Lecholov Shemnilam Afrei Kalika. And if he does that, retroactively, no communicate excommunication whatsoever will be applied to him. For the in the very outset, the decree was on those who rebel and are willful sinners. They do not care at the seek of atonement. They come to Shul to begin with the talk from heaven and from man for this grievous sin. I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about somebody who does it unintentionally. This excommunication applies to when people speak deliberately and brazenly. Not a person who forgets Shnizam and Piv Kamatevis Mazkavan or unwillingly uttered a few words. And it's not a chasra cloud, does not require at least for the excommunication because he didn't, he's not a, a habitual talker in Shul. And God, who's right, examines the hearts and the kidneys, so to say. He probes man in his integrity and is able to discern the deliberate offenses and unwitting ones. And after that, bends over a prayer. Be benevolent, O God, unto the good, meaning on those who refrain utterly from idle speech, unto those who are upright in their hearts, meaning also to those who are hard, who are, whose hearts meant well, from the, whose lips a few words inadvertently escaped. Everybody that goes to show should read this letter once in a while, and they'll stop talking, hopefully, when they go to show to pray. Very powerful Tanya of the day. Today is the 24th day of the month. Where he said in the synagogue that it's uh, once a year, we say the Hallel 10 days in a row. Only once a year, and that's just that's on the holiday of Sukkot. We just said Hallel for the last nine days, and today we say it on the tenth time because it's the twenty fourth day of the month, and the twenty fourth day of the month is the Hallel in the Psalms. So the Hallel in the Psalms is chapter one hundred and thirteen to chapter one hundred and seventeen. Chapter one hundred thirteen, chapter one hundred and seventeen, and you were done the Hallel and the Shitas of the day. I wish you all a great day, a wonderful day. See you, Mitchum, tomorrow, where we'll continue the Shitas of the day.